Assalamu alaikum. I'm Imam Dai Abdullah, the director of LGBT Outreach Program at Muslims for Progressive Values. In this video, we're going to talk about the understanding of the Sodom and Gomorrah story in three periods in Islamic history. To fully comprehend the understanding of the Sodom and Gomorrah story in the Muslim community, we need to look at the Jewish and Christian understanding. The Jewish and Christian communities have understood the story differently from each other for centuries before Islam came as a faith. Having been the background faiths to the new monotheistic faith, Judaism and Christianity have set the tone for the understanding of this story in the Muslim community in a deeper way than many contemporary Muslims realize. As you will see, Muslim understanding of the Sodom and Gomorrah story changes throughout history all depending upon either Jewish or Christian influences. During the Prophet's life in the 7th century, there wasn't any prosecution for any crimes relating to homosexuality, although there had been some prosecutions for abuses relating to heterosexuality. The Muslims of the 7th century, after the Prophet's death, were confronted with two viewpoints on the Sodom and Gomorrah story in the Jewish and Christian communities. The transfer of this information came through the religious stories taught by Jewish and Christian converts to Islam, explaining the earlier stories about the prophets found in the Quran. The Jewish understanding of the story was that the story of the people of Lot was actually concerned with inhospitality. The second viewpoint came from the Christian understanding of the story, which was based on the idea that it was both inhospitality and sexuality. Although Islam is very closely associated with Judaism and its religious rituals and practices, some Muslims later took on the Christian viewpoint of Sodom and Gomorrah because of the cultures in which those Muslims were a part, either socially or politically. However, during the 7th century, Muslims did not prosecute anyone with the Christian understanding at that time. On the other hand, the Jewish understanding seemed to have been applied at least once under Abu Bakr's reign, in which a tribal leader, a leader who was cutting off the supplies carried by caravans, was indeed prosecuted with that inhospitality understanding, having been burned, which oddly enough was actually a Christian way of prosecuting people. In that sense, we can see how the Islam of the 7th century was influenced by both Judaism and Christianity. During the Islamic Golden Age, things had taken more formally in the Muslim community in regards to understanding of the Sodom and Gomorrah story. But, first, let's understand the development of the Abbasid period, which lasted from 750 to 1258 Common Era, which is the period generally referred to as the Islamic Golden Age. The first collection of the Hadith by Bukhari, the most authentic of the Hadith, began 826 CE, and at which point Bukhari was only 16 years old. However, before Bukhari began his collection, there was an Abbasid Caliph who was deposed just three years before Bukhari was born. That caliph, whose name is Al-Amin, and who happened to be the son of the celebrated Abbasid caliph, Harun al-Rashid, was a caliph for about four years, between 809 and 813 Common Era. What a lot of people don't know is that this caliph was actually openly homosexual and had a live-in male lover. It was also during this period that the most celebrated author of Arabic poetry, a poet named Abu Nuwas, had lived. Abu Nuwas had worked for Harun al-Rashid, especially teaching poetry to his future caliph son, Al-Amin. Abu Nuwas and others had composed many romantic poems about men during the entire reign of Harun al-Rashid and Al-Amin. Interestingly enough, Abu Nuwas was imprisoned by the same new caliph who had deposed El Alamin. This new caliph's name was El Mahmoun, and he was the half brother of El Alamin. Abu Nuwas died in prison, although some people have claimed that he was poisoned in prison at the caliph's request. 
So is it a coincidence that when Bukhari's collection of Hadith and the reign of a more conservative leadership at the top level of the Muslim community of the Islamic Golden Age coincide? Perhaps not. According to some reports, Bukhari's father was very rich, which means he was in the elite, and he left the majority of his wealth to his widow and two sons. Something else that we need to remember is that Bukhari was a follower of Imam Shafi, who happened to be the student of Imam Malik, the founder of the Maliki school of thought. That means, by that time, different jurists had already begun to make their own diverse legal assumptions, many of which relied on conflicting early stories about the Prophet and his companions. During the Abbasid period is also the time when Greek works had been translated into Arabic. Greek already had been the language of Christianity. Similarly, the Abbasid period is also the same period when Jewish thought had begun to influence Muslim rituals and practices in Muslim Spain and elsewhere. During the modern times, from the mid-1700s to today, when Muslims in many countries ended up under the control and power of European colonialists, we see that the laws in regard to homosexuality, many of which were called sodomy laws, became more stringent as well as diverse. In many Muslim countries where homosexuality is either outlawed or regulated, we see that these laws are a perfect marriage between fossilized Islamic positions and colonial laws. Depending on which colonial powers was in charge at whatever particular country, because sometimes the same colonial power acted differently in different countries, we see that these laws are just as different as their colonialists. For example, the British and the Muslim nation of Malaysia had left behind a homophobic law in place. On the other hand, just next door, Indonesia, which is another Muslim country that has a lot of cultural similarities to Malaysia, has never had such laws, simply because they were colonized by the Dutch. The Dutch have not had any laws against homosexuality since they were overtaken by the French in 1811, just 11 years after the Dutch colonized Indonesia. In another example, in the Arab world, laws against homosexuality have varied. For instance, in Egypt, there are no laws particularly against homosexuality, but homosexual acts have been prosecuted in the near past. On the other hand, Lebanon has laws against homosexuality, but the Lebanese culture has been far more accepting of homosexuals than other societies in the region. For example, there are LGBT organizations and pride parades in Lebanon. Similarly, in Jordan, homosexuality has been legal since 1951, making it one of the only countries in the region to explicitly allow consensual homosexual acts. Although all of these countries are Arab countries, because of their backgrounds with different colonial powers, their attitudes and laws are different from each other. In conclusion, it is very clear that Jewish and Christian viewpoints have contributed to the understanding of the Sodom and Gomorrah story in the Muslim community. We know from scholars, for example, that the inhospitality viewpoint of the story, the way it was understood by Jews, was lost to the Christians in translation during the Hellenistic period. It is no wonder, then, that Muslim understanding of the story has shifted back and forth between these communities, from early periods of the faith in the 7th century, the Golden Age, and modern times.